Well, what has uh, influenced my creative life was that it was heavily supported in the home where I grew up. My mother is a watercolorist. She passed away uh, five years ago. And my father, during the war, besides working on the Manhattan Project, he was, he were, he was an usher at the old Metropolitan Opera House. Can I, can I stop you for one second? Yeah. Can you look at me? Oh, yeah. Sorry, hon. It's okay. Just um, he worked as an usher and saw premieres of Jerome Robbins' ballets and she saw Jerry Robbins dance and took my mother on dates there. Um, he played a little guitar. So music, art, opera, symphony orchestras, all of those wonderful things that humanity makes when humanity is at its best was in the home I grew up in. I had two older brothers who were both very influential. They both played guitar. And they bought the best records and I got to listen to them. So it was in my home was the most influential place for me in the arts. When things are going well for me, as a musician. I'm not aware of my body. I'm not aware of any physicality of what I'm doing. It's all part of the flow of the idea from my brain through my hands and feet that I've practiced, that I've made, I've consciously practiced it for so long that it's in my subconscious, it's in my motor memory, and it's not a conscious thought at all anymore. The conscious thoughts come with when other musicians I'm playing with may stray from their goal, and my job is to help them rope them back in, or the opposite, if it's a jazz situation, help them to stray further. And I use whatever I have in my musical intellect to, to help that out, to make that happen, to encourage it, to support it. So I'm not thinking when I'm playing when music is right. Most of the time though, however, we're following a conductor. Oops. Therein lies the peril, because we're, they are our leader, but yet I've forgotten most about time and rhythm than they'll ever know. So I have to make that adjustment. So that's when it becomes conscientious actions. But real art and music, when I'm really swinging or playing, I'm not thinking. I'm just playing. The amount of times in a performance year that I have that feeling of weightlessness playing where it feels exceptional are very few. And it's been that way uh, since I was very young. I asked all my teachers about that, that certain buzz you get when music is really happening. And my teacher at Eastman said, if you get it two or three times a year, you're lucky. And uh, he was right. So what I've done to compensate for that, I have a jazz trio of people I like to play with. I go outside of my profession where I'm not making money, where I'm playing music for joy. So I have more of that in my life to feed me as a, a, as a musician and person and human. So I go outside of the parameters of our profession. Within the profession is very little. I'm happy to tell you what I know. Yeah. I'm, I kind of live an open book life and always have. Okay. Doing what I do for a living it's, it's kind of, you're bearing yourself, you know. Oh, yeah. I'm not playing second violin in the back. Everything I play is an audition. Right. For Even with the job. Yeah. You hear every note I play all the time. Yeah. And it's instant. You can't take them back. And I can't bend them and phrase them. Once I strike them, they're, they're, it's over. So I can't miss. I can't go, wah, slide it and make a phrase out of it. Once it goes, rah, I'm like, oh, it's out there. Now what do I do? So I have to make the adjustments and I have to play that way. 
Let me ask you a question about that before yeah. I go to the third question, yeah. which is, this is interesting. Does the fact that what you do is so exposed... Yes, it is. ...on an implicit level and a, and sort of an, an under, under the radar level... Right. Uh, we hear you and we sense you right. all the time. Sometimes we hear you more, sometimes we sense you more. Uh, because you're the pulse, you're the heartbeat more. Right. Does that feel empowering to you? Or, it, like, what is the burden aspect? Can you talk about the burden? Oh, aspect? very easily. Being a drummer in an orchestra or any group or a percussionist in some situations, it's mostly it deals with being a drum set player. As a drum set player, everything you do is exposed. And all the great drummers that I heard play and worked with and recorded with, because I was lucky I played with them as a percussionist, so I learned a lot from them. We all have one thing in common. We, ha we wear our mantle of impenetra uh, what's the impenet uh, not being impenetrated to find out uh, what our soft spots are per se and our weaknesses are. We, wear, we carry ourselves with great confidence because we have to, because we, we're in the hot seat every time we play. So that forces a player, especially, well, all of us, all drummers go through this, that we're in the hot seat, we get the most criticism and we get the most commentary from, uh, from our colleagues and from our leaders. Some are very benign and some are just so insipid and idiotic that we learn to have a, a kind of a protection. We wear a moat around ourselves, if you'll forgive the metaphor, to protect ourselves. We get, oh, you weren't loud today, I really love the way you play. Oh, you're so musical when you play. You're really a percussionist, not a drummer. Whatever the hell that means. So we all drummers put up with this kind of inane commentary by colleagues and uh, audience members, everyone, that you just learn to go, oh, thank you very much, and just kind of, it's part, it goes with the chair. <clears throat> Do you hate that? No, I'm so used to it, so used to being comments being made to me that, as I said, I wear this coat of impenet. Why can't I say impenetrability? What's the word? Impenetrability. Impenetrability. Thank you. I carry the mantle of the pride that any insipid comment or negative, backhanded compliment, it, it goes in one ear and out the other. Now, if you're going to do that, you also have to take the compliments and let them go out the other ear, too. You, you can't have it both ways, if you, if you understand what I'm saying. You can't be the one that believes their press, but then you get a bad review and you don't believe the press. It's either one or the you got to You can't have it both ways. So if, I, if someone or people are complimenting, I like it, of course, any human being would, but I don't let that stay with me and as, as I don't let the negative comments or the uninformed compliments or non-compliments get to me either. And any drummer that's worked a long time can handle this stuff. That's the difference between drummers and every other musician. I don't articulate what I do that much. With my students around the corner here, I teach adjunct here at NYU. The ones that can play, I will let them into the quote unquote family secrets of the mantle you have to wear when you're a drummer in an orchestra. Because orchestras hear with their eyes, they don't hear with their ears. If the conductor does something real quick with the baton, they'll all jump in. They will not hear a note. I'm playing. Can orchestras hear with their eyes? So, with that in mind, I have to make adjustments every bar. So basically, a drummer in an orchestra is a glorified triangle player. 
That's what I do. And I teach my students these things so they don't get too frustrated. When they start a tempo and all of a sudden by the third bar it's a different tempo. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And how do you deal with that? Oh, geez. There you go. I've never known a world without music. As I said earlier, I grew up in a very supporting home full of the arts, all of them. And so music has always been a part of it. It's not until I grew up that I realized how integral it was for people uh, being together and being happy as humankind. Uh, the greatest example of that is a concert with a sing-along. That's a microcosm of what it could be in a happy world. A sing-along is that simple. When you have 3,000 people at Carnegie Hall singing along with who, whoever the artist is, whether it's Peter, Paul, and Mary, or it doesn't matter, and they're singing together, that's humanity at its best. So music is important at that level. It's just there's just not enough of it, and we're losing sight of that, I think. Or, uh, I, well... I want to say the world needs, but I think there can never be too much music and there can never be too much dancing. Hearing music and dancing. You see a toddler hearing music and they start to dance. My children did it. And if that isn't proof of the, that music is the most powerful force in the world, I don't know what is. I've continued in music since I was a youngster studying it because of the camaraderie of my fellow musicians and the guys that I looked up to, three of whom were my mentors. And that's what kept me going. Was their advice, their musicianship, and their humanity and what I learned from them helped me realize how important it was for me to continue as a musician to pass on what they taught me. Do you feel comfortable sharing one name, perhaps? Oh, yeah. Well, I'll cry, but... <sighs> My most formative teacher was uh, the great teacher, Justin DeChocho. Uh, and one of my mentors was uh, the drummer, uh, Joe Cucuzzo. I learned more from Joe than anyone. Uh, he had recorded with Sinatra, was Tony Bennett's drummer for years, and worked with Rosie Clooney for years, and uh, our, uh, what's this great piano player who wrote Misty? Errol Garner, he was Errol Garner's drummer. He was, worked with everybody. He had a way of reducing a long drawn out description of something, whether it was music or art or politics, he could put it down to three or four words. And that influenced me greatly because being that clear, he could digest something and just minimalize it to something so small without minimalizing what the person was trying to say. If an alien were to land here today, and I was stuck with this alien, first thing I would do would, besides if I could get past being shocked that such a thing exists, I sure hope they do, I would like to share the joy I have. So I would probably start tapping rhythm and hoping that that was some sort of speech that would communicate with this being or life force and maybe it doesn't so I have to go on to something else and then I'd have to get an instrument that I can play a melody on and maybe the pitches communicate a language maybe I would try that to communicate and then with the rhythm and pitches I could dance to it and maybe show the coordination between the rhythm to what my feet and hands are doing and say this is essentially what human beings are.